der heute 50 wird, vielleicht haben wir ja sogar Geburtstagskinder oder in diesem Jahr 50 wird, der hat noch statistisch 30 gesunde Jahre vor sich. Welche individuelle Chance und welche wirklich historische Ära, in der wir leben. Es wird Zeit, finden wir, über diese Chance nachzudenken und das revolutionäre Momentum zu ergreifen. Unser nächster Redner tut genau das. The Aging Opportunity, how we can make the most of the longevity revolution. Das ist das Thema von Mark Friedman, den ich herzlich begrüße und auch noch vorstellen werde. You might be see, keep seated. Wer ist Mark Friedman? Zunächst einmal ist er Gründer, Geschäftsführer und Spiritus Rector von Encore.org, einer NGO aus den USA, die es geschafft hat, den Gedanken der encore Career, wenn Sie so wollen, der Zugabekarriere, in den USA unter genau diesem Begriff, den man ein Stück weit mitgeprägt hat, zu verbreiten. Unter anderem verbreiten, verbreitet mit dem Purpose Prize, der natürlich nicht zufällig hier erwähnt wird, der auch Vorbild ist für unseren Preis. Die Encore Career setzt auf die Idee einer gesellschaftlichen Wirksamkeit im Alter. Die programmatischen Buchtitel von Mark Friedman dazu heißen Encore Finding Work That Matters in the Second Half of Life oder Prime Time, How Baby Boomers Will Revolutionize Retirement and Transform America. Wohlgemerkt nicht äh, America Greater machen. Unser Redner würde sich davon bestimmt distanzieren. <lacht> Unser Redner ist Yale-Absolvent, hat lange für die Non-Profit-Organisation Public-Private Ventures an kommunalen Sozialstrategien gearbeitet und noch bevor er Encore erfunden hat, hat er das Experience Core 1995, das Experience Core gegründet, eine Vermittlungsagentur für Menschen in Schulen, für ältere Menschen in Schulen und Jugendeinrichtungen. Für uns in der Körperstiftung ist Mark Friedman langjähriger Inspirator, Redner, Impulsgeber beim Demografiesymposium wie auch bei unserem Berliner politischen Lunch. Und jetzt eben ist er Berater für Zugabe. But we did not only profit from your speeches and advice over the years, Mark. We also are very happy that we can call you a true friend. And we're really honored and we're very happy that you took your time to come over this time again, just for us, just for one day. <laughs> Thanks very much. And we're looking forward, yeah. Mit dem Mikro in der Hand lässt sich schlecht klatschen, aber Sie haben es genau an der richtigen Stelle getan. We are very happy, Mark, that you're going to present us your, your vision of life after midlife and the story of the longevity revolution that you started with Encore. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. And um, I want to start with enormous gratitude to the Kerber Foundation for the inspiration we're receiving in America from this work. And even personally, I, I feel that spirit of revolution that brings me back to when we created the Purpose Prize 10 years ago, or actually 12 years ago. The, the goal was to be revolutionaries, and it was to attack every prevailing stereotype about older people and in America and to and what the aging of our society was going to mean. This was a time when people were beginning to become aware of the demographic change that was underway. And the universal reaction was negative. Uh, they, we, we heard about uh, the long gray wave of greedy geezers. That was a term that became very popular that was taking bankrupting posterity that was a source of decline in the country. There was even a cover story in one of the most popular magazines in America about the aging society, and the title was The Coming Death Shortage. So that, that gives you a sense of the context out of which the Purpose Prize arose. And uh, we wanted to be blasphemous. We wanted to uh, completely disrupt and upend these stereotypes about older people, not just that older, older people and the aging of society was every bit as much an opportunity to be seized as a problem to be solved, uh, but that older people could actually be innovators, 
be creative, be entrepreneurial, be a source of, of new ideas. And the, the prize itself had uh, grown out of almost a decade's work of research and slowly gathering um, a conviction that the older population contained many, many innovators, that there was a pattern right in front of us, hidden in plain sight, waiting to be discovered, but for the most part completely overlooked. And I remember the, the beginning for me came almost 10 years before we launched the Purpose Prize. So this is nearly a quarter century ago when I was introduced to a physician uh, in his 60s by the name of Bill Schwartz, uh, who lived outside of San Francisco. And as he uh, moved into his fifth decade of practicing medicine, um, felt a strong desire to give back to the community. And in fact, he had been trained as a doctor in a community health clinic, and he felt that doing that service early in his career had shaped the whole arc of his midlife work, and he wanted to, to give back. So he went to a local community organization that was focusing on services to the poor and offered to provide free medical care to, to individuals coming to that, the, the Samaritan House Community Center. And he started one night a week, uh, it was a Tuesday night, examining patients on the conference room table of this community center. And soon word got out and a line began forming outside the door and so he started volunteering uh, on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. And instead of the line growing shorter, the line got bigger. So he reached out to his friend, Walter Gaines, another physician who was in his 60s, and asked him if he could help. And they opened up on Wednesday nights, too. And the line kept getting bigger. And finally, um, uh, Bill realized that there was a, an opportunity to uh, put asset and need together, because he knew so many other doctors who were late in their career who were trying to think about what's what's next and who had grown tired of the work that they were doing uh, in the middle years. And he um, came up with the idea of creating a free medical clinic staffed entirely by retired doctors to serve uh, low-income individuals living in the, in the community, the Samaritan House Free Medical Clinic. And uh, they opened their doors and they were deluged not only with patients but with older doctors and nurses and dentists who, who wanted to serve in the community. And by the time I met Bill, they were serving 5,000 uh, individuals a year and had created something that I think of now as a kind of medical utopia. Uh, because unlike, I don't know how medicine is practiced in Germany, in the United States, it's very um, rushed. Um, uh, there, it's very hard to see your doctor. The doctors at the Samaritan House Clinic would spend an hour with a patient. They'd really try to understand their lives, not just the particular symptom that they were coming in with. And word started getting out about the, this clinic, and it became a destination for young medical students at residence at Stanford University's Medical School and the University of California at San Francisco, two of the best medical schools in the country. Uh, by the time I met Bill, not only were they seeing 5,000 patients, but the Samaritan House Free Medical Clinic had become the preferred uh, rotation for medical students from those two institutions. And when you'd go in there, you'd see these remarkable intergenerational exchanges between older doctors who were peppering the young ones uh, for questions about the latest developments in the, in the field. And these young doctors who were eager to find out um, uh, what the soul and spirit of medicine, one described the art of medicine, which they never learned in medical school. And it was a, a source of uh, that, those relationships, the chance to practice medicine in a way that I think a lot of these doctors had originally gone into the profession to do and had lost over the years of their midlife career. Um, it became a, an enormous source of fulfillment for Bill Schwartz and all of the other physicians who, who came to Samaritan House, which now has three medical clinics and, see, and sees uh, almost 20,000 patients a year. And as part of a, 
a national movement of 100 free cl clinics staffed by retired doctors uh, across the United States. And, but I keep thinking of a story that Bill once told me, um, almost as an aside, uh, about walking down the street in his town and uh, going past one of his former patients when he had his family practice. And they passed each other, and then she whirled around, and she said, didn't you used to be Dr. Schwartz? <laughs> and he, of course, was able to proudly declare that he still was Dr. Schwartz, uh, and maybe even more Dr. Schwartz than he was in, in his earlier period. So we, we launched the Purpose Prize, uh, convinced that there were more Bill Schwartzes around the country. In fact, we had heard dozens of, of stories about other older people working in on issues of homelessness, poverty, the environment, uh, education. And um, uh, in conjunction with two foundations in America, the John Templeton Foundation and Atlantic Philanthropies, we created the prize in, in 2006. And just like uh, when Dr. Dittmer was talking earlier about uh, Herr Kerber's uh, encore career, they both, uh, John Templeton, who founded the Templeton Foundation, and Chuck Feeney, who founded Atlantic Philanthropies, had felt that it was the work that they had done in the latter phases of life in philanthropy and in social change that had actually been their true legacy. It was the work that they most felt they would be remembered for, most wanted to, wanted to be remembered for. Uh, it was, uh, uh, they kind of made a monument out of what is generally was generally considered the leftover years. And so the idea of creating a prize to honor and encourage other people to live out a similar life trajectory was, was personal as well as, as institutional. And I really feel that great resonance here uh, with uh, the Zugabi Prize. Um, and uh, we, um, we launched the prize with great fanfare, $10 million investment from the two foundations uh, for the first years of the prize. We gave out uh, $500,000 prizes the, the first year and for uh, many years to come. Um, we put full page ads in the major newspapers of the country. We whipped ourselves into this revolutionary <laughs> fervor. And then uh, a week before the deadline for nominations was, uh, was up to arrive, um, panic set in. Uh, essentially, there's a, a film uh, in the US that I'm sure many of you have seen, Field of Dreams. Um, and the, uh, the tagline from the film is, if you build it, uh, they will come. Well, we had built it, but there was still a, a large question outstanding whether anybody would actually show up. And we had foolishly decided to give five prizes in the initial year. Um, and so that just added to the, to the anxiety. Two days before the, the deadline, uh, we did a, a pool in our office. We all took bets on the total number of prizes. And uh, even though I'm characterized as a social entrepreneur. The fact is I'm an enormous worrier, and I predicted we'd get 120 applicants. The fact is that we had 183 at that time, so that'll give you an idea of how uh, pessimistic I can be. And then the floodgates opened. And by the time uh, midnight of the, uh, of the day that the nominations were due um, had arrived, we had 1,200 nominations for the five prizes. And we had a very different problem than the one we envisioned, but a problem nonetheless. How do you um, create 1,195 losers? And so we scrambled and uh, created a finalist prize, uh, uh, 50 semifinalists, so at least honor the top 5% of the nominees. And in the, even in the semifinalist group, I, we have a prize in America that's, that's nationally known called the MacArthur Genius Award, which the MacArthur Foundation every year anoints a group of 10 or 15 people as, as geniuses and gives them $750,000 to do whatever they want. And we had in the semifinalist group, the group that didn't even ma make it to the finalists, we had three MacArthur Genius Award winners. <laughs> so we knew we were, we were onto something. And 
In fact, at the end of a decade, we turned the prize over to AARP, which is the largest aging organization in America. We'd had 10,000 nominations uh, over that decade period. Um, and so we, we built it, um, and they came, and they kept coming. And most of all, the, the winners and the finalists and the semifinalists and, and hundreds and thousands of other nominees, they, it, they told a story that went well beyond these rather shocking numbers, at least shocking to us. Um, and I, I think of so many of them, but, but there's one in particular that I wanted to tell you about, uh, a, a man by the name of Gary Maxworthy, who was in the first couple of years of, of prize winners, because I think he exemplifies so much um, that's in, in the design of, and, and spirit of the Tsugabe Prize. He, uh, first of all, has a wonderful name. Anybody who's a social entrepreneur should have a last name that's uh, Maxworthy. I don't know how that translates into German, but in America, it's a very uplifting uh, last name. But he, he's somebody who was came of age in the 1960s and was very much influenced by John F. Kennedy. Uh, and Kennedy's most famous speech was the one in which he, he challenged young Americans to ask not what their country could do for them, but what they could do for their country. And he created the Peace Corps as a, an institution to channel uh, some of that, that energy for people who responded. Um, and Gary Maxworthy wanted to go into the Peace Corps. He wanted to follow John F. Kennedy's dictate. But he, he got married right out of university and had young children. And the idea of going t to a far-flung destination to serve was out of the question. So he, uh, he tucked his ideals uh, back in and uh, became a manager in the food distribution industry, which he proceeded to do for 40 years um, and was good at it um, in California. And he was starting to think that it was time to have uh, another chapter in his life when his wife was diagnosed with cancer and passed away. And it was an existential moment for Gary Maxworthy. And he, he started to think about what he wanted to do with the rest of his life, knowing that there are no guarantees about how, how long life is, even in this era of much greater longevity. And he thought about going into the Peace Corps, this dream deferred uh, that was still available. In fact, older people are the fastest growing group entering the Peace Corps in, in the United States. But by then he had grandchildren. He didn't want to be so far away from them. So he joined the domestic equivalent of the Peace Corps, VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, which was created in 1965. And in its wisdom, they sent Gary Maxworthy to the food bank of San Francisco, uh, which gives out food to, to low-income individuals. And he arrived at the food bank. And um, just like Bill Schwartz, who was really a, a kind of incremental entrepreneur, he wasn't somebody with a grand idea who was going to go out and single-handedly transform the world. He sort of slowly, fitfully came to a realization about how he could he could do important entrepreneurial work. The same was true of Gary Maxworthy. He got to the food bank. He discovered that they were only giving out processed and canned foods because they didn't know how to keep fresh food from spoiling. But he knew from his 40 years in the food distribution business that you could solve that problem. And he solved that problem. He created something called Farm to Family, which gave out produce that was going to be thrown out because the growers in California, I'm sure it's true here in Germany, couldn't sell their blemished <laughs> produce, fruits and vegetables to supermarkets and restaurants. And so it was being discarded. And so Gary came up with a, a logistical system, essentially, to connect this food that would be thrown out um, to these food banks that had been only giving out canned and processed food. And um, he essentially put two and two together, um, except in the case of this older social entrepreneur, 
two and two did not equal four. Two and two last year equaled 120 million pounds of food that was distributed in California that would have been thrown out. Um, and you know, you can think about Gary Maxworthy as the 22-year-old Peace Corps volunteer um, doing good work, maybe teaching science or English, um, and that's wonderful. But but the 62-year-old, 72-year-old Gary Maxworthy um, uh, was able to do something that resulted in 120 million pounds of food being distributed. And it, with, with the Purpose Prize moving to AARP uh, two years ago, I've been thinking about Gary Maxworthy and the other winners of, of the Purpose Prize and what we learn from that experience. And, and coming here today, coming to Hamburg, uh, being part of this magnificent event has forced me further to think about um, what we learned from that period. In fact, even the question about the survey and why stop at 75 made me think of my, my uh, maybe most favorite winner, a man by the name of Gene Jones, who won the Purpose Prize at 92 for the project he started at 85, um, which was to save arts and music education in the public schools of, of Tucson, Arizona. Um, and that was annually reaching, uh, when he received the Purpose Prize, 35,000 students. And Gene Jones, when he got his Purpose Prize, bounded up <laughs> to the stage uh, in a way that I could only hope to at 60 to be able to, to do. And so it really taught us a lot about the, the phenomenon of older social entrepreneurship. And one of the lessons, again, to echo Dr. Dittmer's comments earlier, is that experience and innovation, you know, long thought to be at odds, right? I mean, entrepreneurship is supposed to be the exclusive province of 22-year-olds eating ramen noodles in a university dorm and concocting the next Facebook or Google or whatever. Um, but it, in fact, those two um, um, uh, dimensions can, can fit together like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle um, where people uh, don't reinvent themselves. They don't become a wholly different being, but actually end up reintegrating many of the pieces of their experience uh, all along the way, um, but in a way that, that serves new ends, and in many ways, uh, even more important ones in terms of, of their own uh, sense of significance. Um, and I, um, I think that um, the other big lesson is that, as I was saying earlier, you know, we had this premise that, that, that there were a lot of Bill Schwartz's and Gary Maxworthy's and others like them out there, and in fact there are. There's essentially a new creative class, and it's not the creative class that we've been taught to, to think about, but actually it's one that is doing their, their best work late in the game. And there's now a tremendous amount of evidence to, to support that. Um, uh, there's a, an uh, economist at the University of Chicago, and indulge me this for a second, because I think it's, it's a really important body of work. His name is David Galenson, and he started out studying paintings. You know, what economist studies paintings? But he's interested in creativity. He found this auction house in Amsterdam which had recorded the value of every significant painting sold since the 1850s. And he ran regression analysis after regression analysis. And to his own surprise, what he discovered is that the most, the most valuable paintings were painted either very early or very late. Um, and he studied this in other forms, in, in literature, uh, in sculpture, and essentially came down to two different styles of, of genius. Uh, one is conceptual genius, which he discovered tends to bloom early. Think of Mozart, you know, with these magnificent concertos, you know, emerging from his head fully formed, you know, as a teenager. And Cezanne, who didn't do his most valuable work until he was in his late 60s, and was an experimental genius in Galenson's formulation. And uh, Malcolm Gladwell, who writes about social trends, some of you may have 
read his work. He, he actually compares these two trends to uh, the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac, <laughs> two, uh, two American bands. The Eagles have three greatest hits albums by the time they're 24. Fleetwood Mac fails in at seven different incarnations. They try to be a British blues band, disastrous. They have gray hair, children who are graduating from, from high school, uh, and then they reel off the three best-selling uh, rock albums in, in history to that point. And I think, and, and Gladwell's point drawing on Gallinson is that we're so enamored of conceptual genius of early bloomers that we not just overlook the, the, the late bloomers um, who are just as significant, but we make it as difficult as possible for them to, to realize what they've been waiting their whole life to achieve. And I think the Tsugabe Prize is turning that around. And I think the Purpose Prize uh, did that in America. And in fact, it reflects something that's naturally occurring despite all the obstacles. There's a new study in America by a group of economists, uh, Robert Jones at Northwestern University, Daniel Kim at MIT, which shows that entrepreneurs who are 50 years old and older are twice as likely to be successful as those under the age of, of 30. And they've done other research which further develops that. The Kauffman Foundation in America, the main philanthropy focused on entrepreneurship, has shown that in 11 of the last 15 years, the most entrepreneurial group in the population is the 55 to 64 year old group. So again, hidden in plain sight, we want to hear those stories. We're so desperate to identify entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation with young people that we're overlooking this extraordinary phenomenon right in front of our eyes. Um, the other big lesson that came out for us and really defined the future of our organization from the Purpose Prize is the realization that as dramatic and remarkable as the Purpose Prize winners were and, and the Zugabe Prize winners undoubtedly will be, they were exceptional, they are exceptional, but they're not exceptions. That in fact, they represent a much larger phenomenon that extends even beyond uh, social entrepreneurship that we ended up calling the encore career phenomenon of people who wanted to have a second act focused on the greater good, who wanted to produce a body of work um, that was not just about um, their own personal meaning, but that meant something beyond themselves to, to society more broadly. We did research that showed a few years ago that four and a half million Americans are in encore careers and that 21 million more gave top priority to moving in that direction. And when we looked at how long the encore careers of the four and a half million were lasting and the aspirations of the 21 million, it was about a decade. And I'm not a, a math wizard or an economist like David Galenson, but I think if you put all those numbers together, you get 250 million years, not days, months, 250 million years of human capital and social capital that could be applied to the most significant problems of the day. That's not just a glancing contribution. That's a game changer that's probably in many ways only comparable to the movement of, of tens of millions of women into new roles a, a, a generation ago. Um, so this is a, a, an extraordinary prospect, except it's being thwarted by the absence of pathways to, to purpose. Um, right now, uh, those people who are in the four and a half million group, just like the Purpose Prize winners, in, had to pretty much do it themselves. They had to figure out their own way from what's last to what's next. And so that's caused us um, to focus on trying to create better pathways. One of the things we we've ended up doing uh, is something called the Encore Fellows Program. It's essentially a gap year for grown-ups, an internship for people in their 50s, 60s, and beyond. I don't know how many of you saw the film The Intern with Robert De Niro. It's essentially the intern writ large, but for people moving from the corporate sector uh, to the social sector. And it's been uh, a, a really uh, successful undertaking. Um, uh, and we've had some real breakthroughs so far. So Intel uh, has 
um, proclaim that every retirement eligible employee at the company um, can do an encore fellowship. And if they're selected, Intel pays its $30,000 a year for 1,000 hours of work to be a springboard to the next chapter. And Intel's put $50 million into the program so far and has really sort of shown uh, a way that corporate human resources could, could be transformed. Um, there are other experiments, too. I think of Bill Schwartz, uh, Kaiser Permanente, one of the largest healthcare organizations in America, is now doing encore fellowships for retiring doctors to work in community health clinics and to, uh, to provide service, but to mentor young health practitioners. And they embody, uh, and the Encore Fellows, we've seen this throughout, uh, an idea that is in a book that's coming out in America uh, this coming week uh, called Wisdom at Work. And it's written by a hotel entrepreneur named Chip Conley, who went from starting this hotel chain in his late 50s to becoming the head of strategy at Airbnb. And he mentored the founders of Airbnb at the same time he was learning this entirely new uh, world of, of the sharing economy, and he described himself as a modern elder. And so I think that the Encore Fellows as modern elders. Um, so there's, there's a lot of work to do, I think, both in, in upholding the possibilities of later life, what social entrepreneurs like the Tsukabe Prize nominees and winners are, and also in innovating ourselves so that a wider swath of the population can, can move um, from what's last to what's next in, in ways that are not only personally meaningful, as I was saying, but that mean something to the community. And in fact, what we discovered with the Purpose Prize is that many of the Purpose Prize winners were doing exactly that. Think of Bill Schwartz getting these retired doctors involved in the clinic. One of my favorite current examples uh, is in the UK, so not too far from Hamburg, and it's the Now Teach program. And it was created by fi Financial Times uh, columnist, the, the beloved and revered uh, Lucy Kellaway, who at the age of 58, uh, two years ago, having a daughter who'd been in Teach First in the UK and being inspired by, by her essentially following in her child's footsteps, she announced that uh, in a year she would no longer be writing her wildly popular column for the Financial Times, um, but that she would be in front of a, a classroom uh, in London of low-income students teaching maths. Uh, and then she went further, she said, uh, and challenged her readers to do the same, to quit their jobs. So here's this, uh, readers over 50 to quit their jobs. And not only that, she was gonna create an organization to uh, make that even more enticing, which she originally was gonna call Teach Last as a bookend to Teach First, uh, but just took the advice that it should be called Now Teach. Uh, the program was announced, put 20 slots lined up in the London schools, um, 1,000 people came forward, reminiscent of the Purpose Prize. They scrambled, they created 47 slots. This last year was the first year of it. And it's also interesting that she co-founded this with uh, Katie Waldegrave, a 20-something millennial social entrepreneur and education expert. And so I think older people are already responding to this challenge, not only being innovators, but creating innovations to help others uh, follow in their own path. And I think the time, and I'll close with this, could not be more ripe. And I'll return to, to JFK, thinking of his famous Berlin Wall speech. Um, but two years after he gave the Ask Not speech, he gave his most important speech on aging. It was right before he was killed. And he said that we'd added years to life. Now is time to add life to those years, 1963. Since that time in America, we've added two months a year to the American lifespan. Um, so we've been even better at the adding years to life part, but not nearly so good at life to years, productive life to those years, uh, an opportunity to contribute beyond the self in purposeful ways. And I think now um, is the urgent moment to do that, which is why the prize is so important, uh, because I think 
this period that's accumulated, you had two months uh, a year for enough years and you get a whole new stage of life, as Karin was talking about, um, that is between midlife and anything resembling old age. But it's been described in America, and I have a feeling from what I've heard that it's true here as well, as a season in search of a purpose. And I think that purpose is present in the Purpose Prize winners, in the Tsugabe Prize winners, to come. Um, it's a life that still matters. It's that monument out of what used to be the leftover years. It's the chance to do some of one's most important work to find new meaning. Um, at the same time, um, to provide a, a, a pattern that can help us navigate these massive demographic changes in front of us. So we need to do it. We need to do it now. We need to do it for all those young people who are coming quickly on our our heels, and I'll, I'll close with a, one of my favorite uh, proverbs. It's a, it's a Greek uh, saying, society grows great when older people plant trees under whose shade they shall never sit. So go forward, plant trees. Thank you very much. <laughs>